Hello everyone and thanks for joining me on this webinar. Today we'll talk about DevOps and avoiding the exact thing that DevOps was actually supposed to solve. Uh, but first, let me introduce myself briefly. I'm Tomek Kopchuk and I'm the CTO and co-founder of SwingDev. So what makes me think I have something to say on this topic? So I designed and developed technology for over dozens of startups for our clients. Um, and then I created and managed teams for many, many more than that. Some of them got acquired, some of them got next rounds of funding, some had big exits. And I'm in charge of all the recruitment training and procedures that help us and our clients not to have a security breach just yet. A bit about my company and how it applies to the at hand. So we're a software house and we help startups at all stages with their software needs. You know, from creating whole products, augmenting teams, through product design to security, scalability, and all other sorts of audits. The important bit, what makes the software house different from a product company? We run many smaller teams that create products for a relatively short period of time if compared to the successful startup's lifetime. And in outsourcing part of our business, I'd say that about 50% of our projects are taken over by internal teams and the second half turns into long-term collaboration that we run and support for a long time. As the client's decision very often depends on the local recruitment market, we have to be prepared for a very easy and fast handover. And this forces us to create ways of dealing with maintenance and DevOps in general that are as efficient as they come. And your self-healing infrastructure is crucial. Security needs to be built right in. And all the assumptions around security um, threat models, all the know-how and maintenance procedures, they need to be easily handed over to the client, if ever need be. And let's start by talking briefly about where we, as an industry, stand right now. High publicity security breaches are happening week after week. And my engineers like to spend their time guessing the causes behind each one of them. And usually what comes to mind is perhaps legacy software. Maybe this old school enterprise culture, um, perhaps office politics, you know, the usual suspect. But this isn't isolated to the enterprise cohort, is it? Plenty of brand new startups here. So let's look at the causes according to the professionals. And according to Snike, they can be really summed up into three major groups. Uh, first would be the improperly trained personnel. Um, you know, not adhering to update schedules, ignoring design flaws, missing things in general. Uh, second would be cloud misconfiguration, still a big one. And then software bugs. From other causes, phishing is still going strong, you know, same as reusing credentials. This though is, I believe, a much more understood problem with solutions that more or less work. So let's not focus on those. But looking at those causes, these are not really root causes, are they? Those are symptoms of a bigger problem. And there isn't a single factor that stands out that would give everyone, you know, an idea. Oh yes, this is what we should be doing to prevent this. Um, you know, software infrastructure got complex. Hackers got smarter. They got Shodan, for example. You can scan nowadays a whole IPv4 range in a matter of minutes. If you're looking for a specific version of something that you want to exploit, uh, you can do that. So right now, the landscape is not about targeted attacks anymore. Whatever we're doing right now, it's not enough. So we need to find better and better ways to protect ourselves and most importantly, our users. And here comes DevOps. First, let's look back at the 90s. How did development and ops look before they were joined? Like this. You know, developers create apps, ops run those apps. So did it work out? Of course not. Releases took months. Everyone was on call, at least in practice. Uh, there was no one to talk to about security, performance, monitoring, or even cost. So silos were strong. It was still massively better than letting developers wild on the production machines, but it traded one set of problems for completely another one. Uh, so what did we do as the industry? Well, we combined them, right? This looks great on paper, and it's actually a smashing idea, uh, just so damn hard to implement. 
and it came about mainly to increase the ability to deliver application and services at a high velocity. You know, under a DevOps model, development and operation teams weren't siloed anymore on paper. And these are often called the pillars of DevOps. Um, but you all have that, right? Everyone does. It's been a practice for quite some time, and this is well demanded by your potential hires. I don't think this say anything about having or not having a DevOps culture. This has nothing to do with the cultural change that's needed. You know, it's just really a minimum needed for production-ready application, um, regardless of anything else. Um, especially if you forget about the microservices part, which is highly debitable. So what do we do if we really want to achieve what we're thinking about uh, in, in when we're just saying DevOps? You know, security, velocity, uptime. That's it. You could probably add scaling and compliance to it. Um, tools help, but are far from enough, especially when it comes to security. So when time came for us to expand on DevOps, which was many years ago now, uh, I asked a couple of fellow CTOs from Silicon Valley, how did they go about it? And what was the outcome? Back when they had under 200 engineers as we do. And first of all, I started, I started by asking a question, who drove implementing those pillars in your organization? You know, just out of curiosity. And they said it was either the CTO or if one was lucky the first amazing hire. And it was exactly the same for us. Uh, I drove this and it preceded any DevOps culture and was just one of the first things people did when starting a new project. I believe this is paramount for the problem that will follow. So they asked, at what point in time did you start this venture into DevOps or Ops as a thing that you actually name in your company as DevOps? And lack of time or sudden understanding of human mortality was common. And it was the same for us. I realized that if something happens to me, the company would have a problem. Uh, they'd solve it, I'm sure. But I was a bottleneck and a knowledge silo for a lot of things. So the next logical step, you either hire someone or you promote from within. And from here, the stories diverge a lot. So did it help? Um, no and the yes, because it gave them more time. But almost all of them said that this did not solve those three critical problems. And many pieces were still missing for quite some time or still are missing. So let's run through those problems and what I found out. So first of all, engineers still made mistakes and they always will. Those were often caught during code review, but some obviously got through. Um, and even with the most stringent procedures in place, updates were sometimes ignored. And you see, it was still very often us and them kind of situation. So someone was responsible for security and everyone else is responsible for making progress. Now this creates a conflict with security and metrics and this sort of thing still being seen as something preventing moving forward. It's exactly as it was with ops. So those are real quotes from retrospectives and startups that I shall not name. I might have rephrased them slightly so they're less boring, but I promise I didn't change the general gist of it. This CV doesn't look like it got affected. Um, in this particular case, it did. And engineers will make this kind of decision on the go often. The subway wasn't straightforward because we had this thing. Um, so the upgrade in question got postponed and postponed. And later on, it was actually never done and found out during SOC to review. Send this password over direct message because it's, it's just much quicker. And you know, those reasons, they're all true. And if you think about it, they all did the best they could to achieve their goals. They just happen to be sometimes different from your goals. And I started to realize that we're missing one key component in this, which is security understanding and security practice. I believe that security awareness is by now quite widespread. You know, everyone knows more or less what they're supposed to do or supposed not to do, but they don't know why and how this applies to every single line of code they write. Mm, I started thinking that it can't really be a person or a department that is responsible for security. 
It just has to be everyone. But first, let's go through the other ones, diverging from security for a moment. We didn't deliver because someone was busy and couldn't get this set up quickly. No comment needed. Blame pass on. Mind you, this happened in a startup at an early stage where people generally cooperate with each other very well. Um, they have to. And they didn't have a problem with culture in general. Actually, they are striving. They're one of the best companies out there right now if I had to, um, if I had to gauge. Now, waiting for security review environment. This is more common in later stage companies with separate ops departments. And it's a timeless classic. And this is my favorite one. If I had full AWS access, I'd have done it in 15 minutes. They were right. You know, this frustration is real. They would have, they would have gotten it done if not for those you know, procedures and reviews. And I'm quite sure most of the engineers did set up a couple of lambdas, so like a serverless project for themselves. And it did take like 15 minutes. And they can't really understand what's taking so long. And you know, personally, I always believe that as little people as, as little people should have access to anything really as possible. I did revise that view since then, or rather tweaked it. Another one, metrics are in the backlog. This was after learning from my user, mind you, about downtime, one that wasn't visible in Pingdom. Context, CDN reconfiguration. Um, I didn't know it had to work with post as well here. It's never infrastructure, it's always one of the commits. So we need more tests, less tests, different tests. Again, you know, they're all probably right, every single one of them. And all of those stories share the same pattern. Bad communication with different goals as understood by different people and passing blames, which is exactly the definition of silos. So how to fix this? Let me tell you the story of what we ended up doing after a couple of iterations. And disclaimer, I'm not trying to say that this is a silver bullet or that this will work in a startup with a closely knit team working on one product, but it does work great for a software house. And I want you to use my experiences to get the things that could help you out of this. And I believe the solution lies in invoking a cultural change among all engineers, instead of just forcing good practices. So how do you do it? Our job is to nurture the thought process that separates people who work with, infras with infrastructure from people who generally don't. And you know this certain paranoia that's necessary to write secure code. And the holistic change is the key here. This has to affect everyone because you know security resilience and all the other things we need are as good as they are in the worst component usually so adding a web application firewall or just buying an ids this gives you this well done feeling but that doesn't change the fundamental problems hidden deep in the code base and there was something i always felt we did really well as a company and that's hands-on security experience and upscaling experience Security, because I wanted to, you know, everyone to share my passion for it. So I just started showing them the fun parts, which is really hacking into systems and performance. Well, we had a couple of truly high traffic projects, you know, Instagram stars, entertainment industry. The ones where traffic just go from zero to peak in half a minute after publishing an Instagram post. I happen to love this too. So here's what we do. We do hands-on workshops, spend four hours, and let people really experience the matter at hand on their own from both perspectives. For instance, one of the most recent, one, recent ones we did, we created a perfectly good-looking Node.js app that's just inherently flawed, but flawed in a non-obvious way. And we used real code from projects we've seen or from Stack Overflow, which can be a real treasure trove of horrible code, I find. So then we divide everyone into two kinds of teams, attack and defense. And attacking teams have to breach the application, defense has to protect, capture the flag. So this way, everyone gets to see the impact each line of code has on overall security. And they start getting this feel for insecure bits. You know, they get to, they get to use each of the OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities to actually steal the data, money, whatever. And they also get to see why we go through all the trouble with defense in depth. 
my favorite example is just leaving out a vulnerability that gets you full access to the shell in a web app. Tragic. And you know, tragic as it is, this can be completely useless to an attacker if there are additional layers of defense present. And I was then trying everything they can think of to send a 15 megabyte SQL dump anywhere else, like anywhere outside of this machine. And we did many of those over the years. And they've all been very fun. The most important part is I do see this reflected in our code base now. I see, but what if this guard will fail mentality? Um, my second layers of defense, uh, less assumptions. Most of all, I see that it's more efficient and not less. Because writing secure code doesn't necessarily have to take that much more time, but it certainly will if it has to be redone after code review. So I tried incorporating this exact thing into our DevOps department. Hands-on experience. Make engineers responsible for running application A to Z, but within safe boundaries. With supervision and training, but in the end, they will be the ones creating, running, and maintaining all of it, using the same procedures we as DevOps do. In general, uh, we just make them do everything DevOps usually do. Or at least, that's what they believe. Because it's not about developers taking over ops or having full unlimited access to production. It's about shared ownership and having a common goal. They get to learn the ops mindset and take it to their code. It's about giving them just enough so that they only care for it and learn from it, but not enough for their inexperience to hurt you. And sold them on the professional level of supervision. So infrastructure is created by code nowadays, at least it should be, and developers know code, so barrier of entry is low. Um, but the threshold of excellence, especially when it comes to security or reliability, is actually quite high. So here comes the part DevOps engineers play. They're responsible for giving developers all the information they'll need to create a secure solution, plan the defense in-depth approach with them, perform very light threat modeling, help them supervise and give the final review, and have the proper environments in place where it's safe to play. At the end, they execute this together as not all developers have access to production infrastructure, not to mention right level access. Uh, that's for beginners. For advanced adepts, it gets easier. You just help plan defense in depth approach, review, execute. For experts who are in fact at the DevOps level, they just don't really know about it, even easier than that. Final review and execution. So I was surprised how quickly developers climb the ladder and how soon they are able to map potential risks and introduce mitigations on their own. Because if you think about it, ultimately, this is not some sort of arcane knowledge available to the chosen few. It really isn't. But there's a couple of prerequisites we found. And let's go through them. So most of the developers I know do this create, test, fix, test, done kind of workflow. You know, improvement loop of sorts. And as you can imagine, this is not how things are done in life environments, really. So we make sure they do have an environment in which they can, which they can use to develop their solution. And we do three things. First, local environment is always made to simulate production environment completely. It's usually based on Docker Compose, all third-party APIs are included using separate accounts to prevent any real data from any app there. And what can be or shouldn't be done this way uses mocks, but not just normal mocks. They are all flawed by design with configurable delays and certain number of error responses so that they understand the impact and infrastructure on their APIs on their application. You know, timeouts, wonky APIs, bad networks. Um, <laughs> yeah, half of the APIs we're using nowadays have horrible SLAs and up times. And because they're dealing with the same issues as we do. And it's good to know about this during early development and just mitigate, you know, automatic retries, handling of errors. Um, again, it's not rocket science. And this, is, uh, this, this environment has to be complete. If we use a CDN, we simulate a CDN. It's remarkably quick and easy to do. Suddenly, no problems with caching, even with CDN cached bits of APIs. And then we automatically clean all storage, all databases in those shared development environments, 
We can either wipe them clean or make them revert to fixtures every eight hours. Um, this is just a second precaution. If someone uses real data by a mistake on that, it will get wiped. Um, and when someone makes a complete cock up on an infrastructural change while testing on that, no harm done, lesson learned. Never happened yet though, but we have to be prepared. As far as infrastructure as code goes, we use Terraform for everything, but Kubernetes. Kubernetes is special. We embrace GitOps. Um, it's the ability to manage all or some Kubernetes objects through Git. I have to say it streamlines code review, or rather infrastructure review in this case, rather well. I highly recommend this solution if and only if you combine it with very good airbag permissions. Um, and infrastructure as code is crucial. This gives you the ability to review and compare and ability to recreate if everything is completely broken. It's important as no change can go just you know unnoticed during review. Um, I am an airbag permissions because we don't want to revert to developers just running production. Why not? You might ask. So I'll still a quote here from the Redgate blog. Usually, when someone tells me, yes, we work in a DevOps model, what they really mean is we rely on developers to build, deploy, manage all of our environments, mostly by hand, badly. That's not what we want. And no one can just break production by accidentally running a command, and let's say Terraform on the wrong environment. This needs to have more than one line of defense. And let's not spend too much time on this because every one of you will create their own procedures for it, but you need to do that. And let's go back to what the DevOps engineers have to do in this model. Um, how to give engineers all the information they need to create something they never did in a secure way. So for beginners, it's easier, I find. Um, you need to make them understand why each of the components is done the way it's done. Um, give them patterns and practices. Lay down the procedure for testing their solution for them. But for more experienced people, sit down with them and do a light version of threat modeling. You know, include an item that says something like human error while performing this exact task and mitigate it or let them mitigate it. This gives them this mindset of what it means to be a good DevOps. And focus on the thought process rather than the effect itself. For the help part, if DevOps knows something, they should suggest it, points in the right direction, balances with the engineer's ability to figure things out. Um, you basically need people who are good educators and communicators. Don't worry too much about wasting an additional hour on this, um, as this is an investment. But do control the progress and give hints so that not too much time is wasted. You know, some people will be getting stuck rather often at the beginning. It's completely new to them. For the review part, um, I found it much safer and more educational to have in-person reviews. Or, or, of course, remote reviews, just one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, focusing on the threats, mitigation, difference in depth applied and the testing process. Because this is the final safety check. I found that once this review finds a flaw or two, this person never again complains about having to schedule it or having to wait for it a day or so. Uh, the scheduling is in advance and just incorporated into their sprint delivery plan. It's usually not an issue. Um, everyone gets how important this is and how easy it is to make a mistake after they've done one. So what about different levels of engineers? Mm, juniors should get exposure to infrastructure and security as soon as possible. I think, but don't expect them to get it right. Guide them, focus on the process, what to look for, what to predict. Um, sometimes you'll have to do the whole thing for them, but with them, and it's fine. Needs, needs are kind of easier to guide, eager without overloaded ego yet, and they tend to grow and learn the fastest. Now with seniors, here's the problem. They tend to think they know. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And the process has to catch those things. On the other hand, they tend to be the first to incorporate DevOps experiences into code writing practice and pass this on to their teammates, which is exactly what we're aiming for. So let me tell you a story. 
So a simple story of a simple thing that DevOps people do all the time, but developers tend to struggle a bit with at first. Um, this is not even remotely related to bigger tasks like updating infrastructure, but shows the whole process rather nicely. So one of the developers came in and said he needs to change the metadata of almost all objects in production S3. Just imagine switching content type to application PDF. So I asked him, how would you go about this? I got this. As you can imagine, this would not end well. So we did a light thread model. So what can possibly go wrong? So we, well, he came up with too many files might be included. So he suggested we test with a dry run and test with uh, another bucket, let's say. Good idea. Also, it's a copy from cell onto cell. So what's copied? There's, you know, ACL versions and only then counted metadata. So he suggested testing on one file on a test bucket, make sure it's got everything exactly as it used to be. Great idea. I let him with this. Later on, he came back and said, <laughs> well, actually it wouldn't because we've got a couple more safeguards there and it actually doesn't make it public. It merely resets the ACLs we set, but the default one is private nowadays. But this lesson stayed with him. And this may be a much better engineer because he started questioning what things do and became quite good at the ops work. Uh, from what's more important from my perspective is I can trust his judgment now um, about operations infrastructure. But after I showed him why it would be safe nevertheless, this sparked a longer discussion about defense in depth and how we all inevitably make mistakes and we just have to design for the fact, especially when it comes to DevOps or operations. And those discussions, having experience cocking up in a safe environment and then being able to execute the good thing in the real environment, this seems to spark ownership, responsibility and thinking one step ahead at all times. So what about the effects on 24 seven support? Um, this is the one thing where engineers technically can take over ops, but in my opinion, this only works for smaller teams. So we learned some from Stripe assessed once that 24 seven on-call rotation requires teams of at least eight engineers. I agree with this. Being on call is one of the most stressful jobs in the industry. And while this is just part of our jobs as engineers, we shouldn't contribute to it. So in an MVP or an early stage software, um, infrastructure rarely is the issue I found. Code usually is, or scaling. Um, an edge case that turned out to be common, API quota no one thought of, you know, stupid things. And having engineers with all the power and all the experience to assess and debug live infrastructure is having competent people solving the issue. Because now they're not afraid of the infrastructure, they understand the A to Z, they understand the application A to Z, no silos, and they get to own their work from scoping to monitoring and production. And even metrics tend to get created alongside the features. You know, if needed, they can always call a DevOps who will help them with their usual infrastructure level problems like network. Um, quoting Will again though, teams with fewer than four individuals are a sufficiently leaky abstraction that they function indistinguishably from individuals. To reason about small teams delivery, we have to know about each uncle shift, vacation interruption. And this is why we rarely do SLA support better than next day with our traditional sourcing offering, as with often less than four engineers on a project, it's doomed. We do that when we have an ongoing relation with a bigger team and in other cases, just focus on self-healing because the value of SLA would not counterbalance the cost for the client. So that's what we recommend. On the other hand, in the team building offering, um, SLAs make complete sense. And this size of teams is very possible and feasible with local rates, um, but it's up to the client how they run their team. So no, I propose this. Do hands-on hacking training with all your engineers. Make all engineers part of DevOps and DevOps part of education. 
So will this solve the problem? Not quite, but it's a great leap forward, I believe. Quite a bit of work will still be left for DevOps, you know, things like updating clusters, keeping up to date on Linux vulnerabilities, hardening everything. But major part of ops that doesn't evolve going very low level is by now taken over by engineers. And as we've seen in the recent years, also taken over by your cloud provider. And it doesn't apply to all the things DevOps do. There's compliance, all sorts of things. But the goal is not to remove them from the picture. And will it work for bigger products and teams? Um, probably not as a silver bullet. But I bet it can augment the traditional DevOps team structure. You know, SRE will stay SRE, uh, so on and so forth, but engineers will still get better at engineering. What to watch out for? Trying to replace dedicated DevOps or ops engineers with just developers doing everything? That's not the point. This has been tried before. doesn't work. Also, some, of the, some developers will just not enjoy working infrastructure at all. They will get extremely frustrated. Don't force them. As for the effect, I found that engineers use the DevOps experience to be better at software architecture and writing code in general. And they get much more security minded and more operations minded. As they haven't just been you know, told those things, they've seen them and experienced them. And this makes all the difference in the world. And that's it for today. So thank you so much for your attention. I hope that this gives you some food for thought. I'm very happy to answer any question, complaints, hit the discussions you might have. Leave the comment and subscribe. Thank you, everyone.